Growing up, John Frankenheimer wanted to be a professional tennis player. As he got older, his love of cinema superseded his dreams of tennis, and he switched to acting. Again, his career path switched when he took a job working for the Motion Picture Squadron of the Air Force. It was here he discovered he preferred to be behind the camera rather than in front of it. Over the next few years, he worked as a cameraman and occasionally as an assistant director. In 1957, he directed his first feature film, The Young Stranger, which he hated. He didn't like the restrictions making movies had as opposed to television. After that, he returned to TV until giving movies another shot in 1961 with The Young Savages. He enjoyed it much more this time around, which led to a long, award-winning career as a director. With numerous Oscar-nominated films like The Manchurian Candidate, Birdman of Alcatraz, and Seconds, Frankenheimer's skills were in high demand. In 1997, he directed the film Ronin, starring Robert De Niro. After putting together his director's cut of the film, the studio wanted to do something he hadn't encountered before, screen the film for test audiences. Frankenheimer's previous few films had underperformed, and considering his film prior to this was the remake of The Island of Dr. Moreau, the studio was nervous. Never mind the fact that Moreau's problems mostly stemmed from producer interference, as well as the star Val Kilmer trying desperately to get out of the film. Frankenheimer was so disgusted with Kilmer, he said in an interview, There are two things I will never do in my life. I will never climb Mount Everest, and I will never work with Val Kilmer again. The movie was a monumental disaster, and if you want to know more about it, you should really check out the excellent documentary Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. The studio had Ronin screened for test audiences, and they were generally positive, but they hated the endings. Frankenheimer had shot two endings. The original ending the test audiences thought was too mean-spirited, and the alternate ending they thought was too cliché. Frankenheimer decided to shoot a new ending, which was different from the previous two. Despite the ending change, the film was what he set out to make. It was a minor hit at the box office, but did very well with the critics. He really enjoyed working on Ronin, and decided he wanted his next film to be another action crime drama. He contacted Miramax because of their track record, and he wanted to work with producer Bob Weinstein. This meant he would also have to work with his brother Harvey. He read a script by Aaron Kruger that he thought would be great. It was a crime thriller about a small-time thief that gets wrapped up in a casino heist during Christmas. He picked the script because it was one of the few times while reading a script where he never saw the ending coming. It was a complete surprise. For the main cast, he hired Ben Affleck as Rudy, Charlize Theron as Ashley, and Gary Sinise as Gabriel. For the supporting cast, he hired Danny Trejo as Jumpy, Clarence Williams III as Merlin, and Vin Diesel as Pug. Frankenheimer loved working with Clarence Williams III and put him in as many of his films as he could. For Nick, he needed someone who was a good actor, but one who wouldn't be well-known to American audiences. He picked English actor James Fran, who had to work with a voice coach in order to lose his accent. For the giant character Alamo in the prison sequence, Frankenheimer wanted someone legitimately scary. He was watching football and saw the defensive tackle for the Washington Redskins, Dana Stubblefield. Frankenheimer called the casting director to see if the football star would be interested in the film. They got back to him and said that he makes six million a year playing football, and he wouldn't want to be in a movie. The casting director brought in actors, but Frankenheimer felt none of them were as imposing as Stubblefield. Finally, Frankenheimer called him personally and told him the shoot would be fun and expressed to him that this might be a good opportunity to set up another career for after football. Stubblefield agreed and was cast for the role. While in pre-production, Vin Diesel had some disagreements with the director over the script and dropped out. This may have been because he received an offer to star in The Fast and the Furious, which in hindsight was an incredibly wise decision. With Diesel gone, they hired Donnell Logue, who had just played a villain in the 1998 surprise hit Blade. Filming began in March of 1999 in Vancouver and British Columbia, Canada. They shot a long opening, hoping to set up the relationship between Rudy and Nick. They brought in Isaac Hayes for a small cameo as Zook. In the scene where Alamo goes to stab Rudy, Stubblefield slipped and fell on Affleck. The actor was crushed under the football player's 6'2", 300-pound frame and was knocked out cold. Affleck suffered a concussion, and they had to shut down the shoot for four days to make sure he was okay. The film was full of clever allusions to Christmas music, as well as things like two of the characters, Rudy for Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and Nick for Saint Nick. From pre-production to filming to post, the film took about 10 months to put together. Frankenheimer submitted his director's cut to the studio. Since Ronan underperformed, the producers were skeptical about the film, so they insisted on showing it to test audiences. This put the director off. In all the time in his very long career, he had only recently had to deal with test audiences. 
In the past, he'd been able to make the film without interference, and as long as the studio was happy, which they usually were, the film released was his vision. Now he had to show the film, and his vision would live or die on the whims of a random selection of people watching it. He hated the idea of the test audiences. Frankenheimer allowed it to be screened, but under protest. The reviews from the test audiences were mixed. A large group of the audience enjoyed the film, but there were two consistent complaints. It was too slow and too violent. The marketing department conferred with the producers, and they demanded the director make alterations to the film. Frankenheimer was devastated. They wanted to lighten the mood of the film, as well as cut down the runtime. He didn't want to make the changes, but was under immense pressure from the studio, so he agreed. There were points in the film the studio noted as weaknesses that could be improved with reshoots. The problem was they were planning on releasing the film around Christmas of 1999, but with the reshoots, the film wouldn't be ready in time. Rather than hold the film until the following Christmas, the decision was made to schedule the film for a February 2000 release. There was one producer who was adamant about editing down the runtime of the film. While it was never said which producer this was, there is a certain person who is notorious for insisting this. This is pure speculation, though. The edits were done to speed up the film. Whenever this happens, the first thing to go is the character development. They cut out much of the dialogue. The beginning with Nick and Rudy was drastically shortened. The scene where Rudy and Ashley are having an awkward first meal together was also trimmed. They removed much of the sex scene. They inserted a lot of forced humor to try to lighten the tone. To appease the audience, they removed much of the violence. The dart scene was shorter. Rudy getting roughed up repeatedly was cut. They removed the guard getting his face smashed. The casino gunfight was trimmed, and so on. Frankenheimer said this neutered the film. He was not happy with this version because it was not what he set out to make. He said they homogenized the movie. They made it consumable for a basic audience. No thought required, just the Saturday night date mentality. They cut down the harshness of the film and made it a truncated, borderline PG-13 version of what it was. The director's cut was 124 minutes. The new version, including the reshoots, was 104 minutes. Frankenheimer worked with the writer and editor to make the director's cut of the film as seamless as possible. Now, with the approved theatrical cut, it was riddled with plot holes. He couldn't stand this new screening process. They weren't listening to what people liked, just what people disliked. So they altered the film to appease the people who disliked the film, which in turn was changing what others liked. So now you have a movie that jumps right into the action, without a real sense of what's going on, or why we should care about any of the characters. Plus, now the action that they were in such a hurry to get to is watered down, you never get a feeling that there's much at stake. In the end, you now have a film that doesn't please anybody. He said he wished he didn't cave to the studio pressure, and just release the director's cut into theaters. That was the movie that he was proud of, not the jumbled mess of the theatrical cut. The film was released on February 25th, 2000. Critics didn't like it, audiences didn't like it, and it was a box office flop, making only a little over $32 million worldwide on a $42 million budget. The theatrical cut was released on DVD in August of 2000. Frankenheimer fought with the studio, and after a considerable amount of time and money, was able to reconstruct the film to his director's cut. He did include some material from the reshoots, but the film was now back to what it should have been in the first place. He also fixed the plot holes that the theatrical cut created. The director's cut of the film was released in March of 2000, but the damage was already done. Most folks weren't willing to give the film a second chance. The director's cut showed this movie wasn't just a dumb action film, but rather a clever crime thriller with a healthy dose of brutal action. Now that Rudy's character development's back, it shows how he's not just a dumb hostage trying to survive, but an intelligent guy who completely outsmarts his captors and talks his way out of his situation. Despite the troubles, Frankenheimer loved working on the film. He stated Affleck, Theron, and Sinise were all incredibly talented, and if they were the only three actors he had to work with for the rest of his career, he'd be happy. Sadly, he was almost correct. While he did do the direct-to-TV movie Path to War in 2002, Reindeer Games was his last theatrically released movie. He died in July of 2002 after having a stroke that was caused by complications from spinal surgery. The differences between the theatrical cut and the director's cut play out like two completely different movies. Without the backgrounds of Rudy and Ashley, the two characters feel like different people depending on which version you watch. The theatrical cut doesn't show how smart the movie is. It does its best to remove the intelligence in favor of rushing to the next action scene. Unfortunately, with most people seeing only the theatrical cut, they're unaware of the real movie. Reindeer Games is another example of why, with the vast majority of films, the studio needs to leave it in the hands of the director. Suggesting alterations is one thing, 
forcing them is another. The producers panicked, and instead of listening to the director, they put a lot of pressure on him to change his vision. Then, when he did, they released it outside of the Christmas window, which made no sense, and when it underperformed, they blamed the director. The theatrical cut of Reindeer Games is just one of many films that suffered because of Miramax. Everything from Mimic, to Black Christmas, to Shaolin Soccer, The Grandmaster, Gangs of New York, The Crow City of Angels, All the Pretty Horses, and many more. Thankfully, Frankenheimer was able to fix the movie on DVD, but sadly, not all directors are given that opportunity. Reindeer Games is completely underappreciated because most folks don't know the proper cut exists. There's still the theatrical cut of the DVD out there, which is also the version that plays on cable. This isn't some bad film from a hack director. This is a smarter-than-average crime thriller from a multiple award-winning director. It may not be on par with Christmas action films like Die Hard or Lethal Weapon, but it absolutely deserves more respect than it gets. If you've never seen it, you really should give it a chance. If you've only seen the theatrical cut, you need to check out the director's cut. Protein, it's good for you. Monster. In the gelatin!